All Great. right, so well, let's begin. Uh, today I have uh, Phil Escott with me. Uh, Phil is an admin on the Facebook group 100% Carnivore and Beyond. Uh, it has 10,000 members. Uh, Phil has uh, two really interesting personal stories about the carnivore diet. So a carnivore diet, for anyone who doesn't know, uh, this is basically a diet where one eats only meat and other animal products. So any type of meat, fish, seafood, eggs, or dairy products. Uh, well, there are some variations, like everyone does it a little differently. Some people uh, uh, do well with dairy, others don't. But, uh, but in general, like everything from the animal kingdom can be eaten. And so today uh, we will talk about Phil's mom who had breast cancer and uh, how she did on the carnivore diet. And uh, also about Phil's personal story. But first a disclaimer, so I'm not a health professional and I'm not advocating this as any cancer cure. I'm not saying that neither me nor Phil know how to cure cancer. We're just, we're just telling one story, uh, um, Phil's mom. Um, and um, so, so yeah, so just, you know, a disclaimer, because this, this is some dangerous stuff to, to say that somebody got rid of cancer without using chemotherapy or radiation. Uh, but I think uh, those stories have value, and so this is uh, this is what uh, we're going to talk about today. So, uh, Phil, first of all, correct me about anything that I said that it, that it was maybe wrong. But if not, then you know, just jump right in and tell us first the story of your mom and uh, what she did to recover. Sure, happy to. Um, yeah. I think you're absolutely spot on with that disclaimer. I think all that we can do and all that I ever claim to have learned to do is to perhaps spot the things that would put the body into distress and confusion. Um, and if you remove them, very often the body brings its own healing systems into play. It's it's nothing to do with me. I don't have a cancer cure. and. Um, you know, I don't, I, I don't think I have a specific cure for, for anything. Autoimmunity might be a little bit more straightforward. Diabetes is <clears throat> more straightforward still. But, um, you know, if, if you take away the things in various areas of, uh, of diet and circadian biology, you know, getting all the light right and getting your sleep right and um, all that kind of thing, then, then the body seems to unwind some amazing things on its own without, <laughs> without any further intervention. But in, in my mum's case, yeah, I've, I've spoken about it a little bit, and I have one, one video on YouTube which shows the, the, the tumour reversing. And, yeah, I'm happy to chat about what we did. <clears throat> I think, um, like anybody with, with any diagnosis in, in the beginning, um, you, you, you sort of panic and do a great big blunderbuss approach and throw everything at it. Um, which is what we did because I'd, I'd reversed my own psoriatic arthritis and written about it and did a book about it and whatever. But um, with my mum, she was, I think, 92 or so at the time. Um, it was probably uh, 2015. And she said, oh, I've got this lump in my breast. And when I realized how big it was, it must have been there for years. She must have been ignoring it. You know, my mum was... Um, we, we'd, we'd looked after her since my father died in 2003, and she had a, a stroke in 1996, which took some of her speech away. That was when she was on statins, of course. When we got them in the bin, she had no more events. <laughs> but, um, you know, with her very incredibly high cholesterol that the doctors said we should always bring down, and we, we never did, and it seemed to be absolutely fine for her. But anyway, she had this breast cancer. Now, I, I think with my mom and the kind of personality she was, a lot of it was kind of emotional. You know, it was interesting. It was over the heart area. It was in the left one. And it was pretty, it was pretty advanced. So I decided to take all the, all the carbs out of her diet. I'd been on a, a ketogenic diet for quite some time. I'd, I don't think I'd gone 
oh yes 2015 i'd gone fully carnivore by then i've been fully carnivore for four years and so i decided to take all the last remaining bits and pieces of 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 um any carby material out of her diet and she was pretty much on a fully carnivore diet from then on um she died last year in in may but that was from um two bouts of pneumonia in a row after she got the flu in the winter she already had um what do you call it bronchiectasis you know very sort of clogged up lungs which is pretty difficult to reverse you can you can stabilize it but it's pretty difficult to reverse once all the sort of alveoli have burst and whatever <clears throat> so anyway um yeah she went on a pretty much full carnivore diet except for a few berries now and again with some um with some uh, greek yogurt and first of all we we gave her all kinds of stuff we gave her all the apricot kernels and um Essiac tea and all the various mushrooms you know the reishi cordyceps that kind of thing just chucking everything at it and it seemed to be okay it didn't seem to be getting any worse um but then we gave her some cannabis oil the proper stuff you know from like the little guy down the road that you can get prosecuted for bizarrely um but at by the time you know this got she probably was um 93 by then and 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 she was <laughs> you know she was at, at 93 years old it's 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 a bit much to be stoned all day and I, i'd sort of go around to her flat and find her doing some strange things <laughs> eventually she got a bit sick of that so so we stopped that one although it was reducing in size when we stopped the cannabis oil um she uh, it started to come back um and it started to sort of break through the skin and look pretty ugly um but then i read i, I don't know i'd, I'd kind of given up and then i had um the you, you know the um the oncologist was saying oh he was very cool actually he was a very cool oncologist i think it's because he was a surgical oncologist and so maybe his whole income didn't rely on 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 the prescription of various stuff you know and and he was he was a bit skeptical to start with and then he carried on being a bit skeptical kept trying to get her to take oh no now i've forgotten what the what the stuff is that you take for breast cancer the hormonal type of breast cancer anyway i started to look online about this and there were some horrific side effects and people were getting dreadful joint pain muscle weakness um it was it was banned in india this this particular drug i'll think of it in a minute um it was a chemo chemo drug yes no no it isn't a chemo drug it's it's sort of more acts on the on the sort of hormonal level they give it quite often for breast cancer he said no no need for chemo whatever we discovered that it had gone into the the lung or kind of between the lungs and into the liver she had a few little ones in the liver and um he said oh you know what we'll do is just keep the breast tumor there to use it as a, a gauge to see whether the rest of them have um are reversing or whatever but it's a miracle drug this is it's a wonder drug it's it no side effects totally safe totally shrinks down the tumor okay um so i started to research into it i've got an open mind you know i don't um, the guy was a cool guy i didn't uh, i don't dismiss anything so I started to research and I found forums full of people experiencing terrible pain and um all sorts of issues a lot of um um like womb pain you know that kind of thing um you know pelvic floor pain and anyway so I said all right then let's let's give it a go so she took it for a week and she got such pain and such weakness in her muscles she fell over in the bathroom and broke her wrist so the next the next time I well, I thought well enough of that and we put that in a bin and the next time we went to him he said how's it going and I said oh cool she's still got the breast cancer but she's got a broken wrist now <laughs> she she had this cast on her wrist and actually that was probably in the spring and uh, earlier in the year we'd we'd done an iodine loading protocol and we gave her the um uh, what's it called lugol's iodine i think it was 7% and we tapered her up to a dose of just like 10 drops a day which i know i notice now is actually a very small dose i thought it was kind of oh that's a bit too much iodine at the time 
but people are taking mega doses now with 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 no problems it seems and and, and reversing all kinds of things with it but I, th- I i just had this thing in my mind i thought well okay you know it's hormonal you see a lot of people taking iodine and painting their breasts with iodine when they have fibrocystic breast syndrome and this seems to be getting rid of all the all the fibroids or the fibrous tissue in the breast so maybe it'll have the same action with with cancer so anyway we loaded her up we we dosed her for like three months or whatever and then brought it back down again to a maintenance dose of about a drop a day and sometimes forgot and whatever and i'd i'd kind of given up it was a couple of months three months maybe after that nothing seemed to be happening <clears throat> and i then i remembered that it, in in the thing that i'd read about this iodine protocol they'd said some often it doesn't do anything while you're doing the loading phase but a, a couple of months three months four months afterwards the tumor will suddenly disappear and i thought well you know and you you you, you still have impatience even even the way I've worked with myself and realized that even if you get everything absolutely right, things can take ages to reverse. You know, it's taken us decades to get into these problems, so they don't disappear overnight. But still, I thought, well, you know, it might have, might not have worked. So I thought, well, okay, I was starting to think about the oncologist who'd said that um, <clears throat> he could take out this tumor on a local anesthetic and it would be very easy. And so, you know, at least it wouldn't break through the skin and ulcerate. <clears throat> too too badly you know so anyway one day she just came into the kitchen i was cooking for her you know and she said it's it's going away and i thought nah you know and i was a bit skeptical i thought well you know she's a bit old maybe she's a bit dotty she's got some idea in her head and i had a look and the skin was almost back to normal you know before then i was sort of painting it with iodine every day and blah blah but i'd kind of given up because i thought well we're losing the battle and it really was reversing. And I thought, well, that's that's extraordinary. So as the pictures show that I put up on that on that YouTube video, it, it got a hell of a lot better. And actually, picture, you know, after that, after I took that photo, it got better still. So, yeah. And then she got this pneumonia about, you know, a year or so after that or two years after that. Uh, but no, it wasn't the breast cancer that killed her. That's for sure. That was that was absolutely fine. But yeah, it, it, it amazed me um you know when these things happen you sort of think no that's too good to be true but um since then i've heard other sort of reports of of things working like that with with hormonally driven breast cancers where you know iodine is a very important thing in 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 hormone production and and particularly for women and you know maybe it does it just helps the body to to notice that those things are going on i think i think what people forget is that we have cancer cells all the time and the body just mops them up um but it's when they get out of hand and if you take away that confusion maybe maybe the body catches up and that seemed to be what happened in my mother's case so this is this is really extraordinary so so okay so a couple of things that i'm taking away from it so uh the cannabis oil you said it really worked but the side effect was that she was basically high from it right (laughs) But, yeah. but it actually, but the but the tumor was getting smaller while she was um, ingesting the the cannabis oil. Yes. Yes. Well, it was it was more difficult to see because by that time it hadn't broken through the skin. <clears throat> so and and you know when it's under the skin it's very difficult to measure and, and so it's difficult to see. But as far as we could see, it was it was shrinking a bit. But it wasn't anything like the dramatic effect that we had after the iodine protocol. No. So how long? was she taking the iodine um before and like at that at that point where she came to you and said you know what i think it's shrinking like for how long was she doing the iodine well she did the iodine probably january february march as far as i remember the the fully sort of did like the 10 drops a day of in a, in a glass of water um and i i would say i i can't remember exactly but I would say it was like two or three months after we finished that, that it started disappearing very quickly. Okay, but so it was, so she was ingesting <clears throat> 10 drops of uh, what concentration iodine was it? Because I believe that there are different concentrations, yeah. right? It was, it was 7% Lugol's, yeah.
yes yes she she um didn't have any bras left that weren't completely yellow on one side <laughs> so we just kept painting it on you know okay yeah. so she was doing this for three months and then she stopped are you saying yeah yeah we, we tapered it down and then it was just sporadic every now and again i think oh i'll just give her a drop in the water now and again you know my mum at that stage you know she was perfectly mobile and and you know quite sprightly and a, a year before that she was picking up my then six seven year old daughter and running around with her you know she was incredibly um active and fit for a for a 92 93 year old but um um you know she um she didn't really look after herself much so everything that was done i did so yes i i remember all of it that's that that's the the interesting thing about this one so you know she she would never have done anything she couldn't be bothered so it was all my sort of biohacking by proxy if you like you know she was totally up for it she was fine but um but yeah it was it was me who did it and so i'd forget now and again i'd go around and cook for her if i was in a hurry i'd drive away and think oh i didn't give her any iodine not during the loading phase but it was after it didn't appear to do anything and i lost confidence in it that it was in the in the sort of months after after she tapered back down to theoretically a drop a day or whatever and um but when, when she once she realized, oh, it's it's actually shrinking. Did she then go back on that ten drops per day protocol? No. No, we never did. It carried on shrinking. Yeah. By that time, by that time, we did nothing. We were doing nothing at all, except for keeping her on the carnivore diet. Uh -huh. Okay. So, so okay, that was my uh, next question. So that whole time, like, um, so so first you started with a carnivore diet, then you added cannabis oil. Uh, then you stopped the cannabis oil and then you uh, started the iodine. But through the whole process, she was carnivore or mostly carnivore, yes? If she was mostly eating carnivore, then I think it's fair to assume that she was in ketosis probably most of the time, right? So is Absolutely. It, yeah, so is it possible that it just took a while for, for, the, for the ketogenic effect, effect to, to um, you know, to affect the cancer and also maybe it was like a compounded effect of yeah. the carnivore diet and the iodine it's very possible it's so difficult to say in these situations isn't it i mean right. you know when people say to me people often often attack me particularly vegans about that video that oh you know it wasn't the the carnivore diet meat doesn't cure cancer and i said no i never said it does I just believe that it's the least the least stressful diet on the body if you're just taking in animal products because you've got none of those plant toxins. Um, you know, it's it it allows the body to get rid of any number of things that might be um, might be causing cancer. I mean, you know, maybe maybe the iodine helped to clear the oxalates in the thyroid, which then help the 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 whole hormonal system to rebalance to reverse the hormonally driven breast cancer. You see, all of these things are guesswork. I don't know, but I mean, it just, it just to me, the 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 one of the main things I like that it proves is that, um, you know, before that she was eating what I was eating. You know, in the years leading up to it, when I was vegetarian, she'd be eating kind of rice and dal and Indian food that I used to cook, and that's supposed to be all beautifully Ayurvedic and very healthy and all that, and it made us all tremendously sick. Um, but all of that time eating meat and and she wasn't even you know she wasn't like me where i was eating kind of ground beef steaks organ meats fish things like that she would really love all the processed meats too you know she was eating at the time loads of salami and and sausages and things like that loads of bacon and and so it, it kind of it kind of makes me think that um it's unlikely that they're carcinogenic if you can give somebody a diet featuring highly in that and they manage to reverse their cancer, whatever else you give them. So yeah, I think I think all these things are compounded. You know, that's that's, that's why I call the the Facebook group Carnivore and Beyond because I love all this other stuff, all the emotional stuff and light and deuterium. You know, and it could have been a whole a whole um, uh, business of deple depleting deuterium in the mitochondria. It could have getting rid of that with the with the low deuterium diet that could have helped to the mitochondria to stop being confused and and to mop up the cancer who knows there are so many angles you can look at this from but i believe if you look at at the carnivore diet from any angle really except the lens of um, conventional dogma 
it's it seems to be quite obvious how it's reversing these things or at least helping to reverse these things and and, and taking the stress off the body that it's been put through with all the you know the layers obviously first of all processed food and then the grains and then <clears throat> then the carbs and and then the um then the plants themselves all these healthy five a day vegetables and fruits that, that we think are doing us so much good so you know i i, I think it just gives the body a break and, and it manages to to throw these things out and you know iodine is very helpful for thyroid health and uh, you know the thyroid thrives on it so possibly possibly it, it helped to throw the, the some oxalates out of the thyroid i it's it's so difficult to say isn't it you know it's so difficult to say that's why all i can say is i believe that there are lots of ancestral disconnects that we have and the more of those you can get rid of the more the body just manages to get rid of these things you know that's all the vegans say oh well of course we ate all these plants long ago yeah of course we did seasonally they were fine the body just probably shrugged them off they didn't mind at all like were, were they necessary no probably not um and they certainly weren't anything like the plants that we eat today but when you when you're sort of surrounded by all these emfs and artificial light wi-fi and stresses of the modern world and junk food then then it, the body has no chance to throw them off so it, you know, I, I, I have much more of a perspective probably of what happened in my own body just because I could go through it and experience it. It's it's very difficult to say what happened in my mum's body because, you know, she was also, because the speech had gone, there wasn't a lot of, um, she didn't have a great deal of descriptive talents in the later part of her life. So it was it was difficult to tell exactly what was going on. You know, she'd say some real strange things. Yeah, okay. <laughs> But, okay, also one thing that is important to know that she was under the care of a uh, oncologist, so it's not like you guys just said, no, we don't want to have to do anything with doctors, uh, we're just going to completely do it ourselves. No, she, she, she was properly diagnosed and, and she had all the uh, conventional care, right? Well, you know, she had the appointments. We'd go along and have big discussions every time. In fact, he was such a cool oncologist. He didn't have like a, a big ego like a lot of these medical guys have. And I used to go in, he'd go, oh, great. You know, we always have an excellent discussion. And, and it was it was interesting. You know, it's like when I went back to him and I said, look, do you have, you know, have you looked at all these um, these uh, side effects from this drug? No, no, we haven't got. I said, I found forums full of people, like I said earlier on. And he was Indian as well. And I said to him, do you know it's been banned in India? And he went, no. <laughs> you know? So we had, we, we, we had some funny discussions and, and he, was, he was very, very cool. I liked him. Um, so how come, how come he said no to chemotherapy and no to radiation or surgery? Was it not able to operate that tumor? Oh, easily operable. Yes, but there wasn't any point taking it out because he was convinced that his pills were going to shrink it right down. And as far as I can see, those pills do shrink it right down and they do have some tremendous results. But you see, I think the cancer guys are often focused on the lumps, you know, instead of being focused on the process. I said to him once, you know, um, what your treatments are doing are attacking the, the healthy cells and the cancer cells. And it's neither of those you really want to attack is it you you want to reprogram the stem cells to be able to mop up and he went yeah that's true and i said well there's only one thing that ever if you see cancer really cure itself you know there's only one thing that ever cures it really and that's the human body isn't it and he said yeah i've got to agree with you there and and he sees that that happens there are ways that you can shrink these tumors down but what damage do you do what what other things do you open up in 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 future years i see a lot of people where they've thrown their arms up and said, what a wonderful success, they're, they're, they're in remission. And then five years later, oh, it came back far more aggressively and we couldn't deal with it this time and the cancer killed them. Well, I, I, I would say that if you, if you understand the body well enough to reverse a tumor by taking away the factors that might cause these tumors, then it's more than likely that in future years, unless some other factor comes in, your tumor is not going to come back again. But if you do it the conventional way, and, you know, maybe they do extend life sometimes, but I think in more cases than not, they're setting the body up for, for it coming back more aggressively in the future. And, and very often, you know, I think, I think chemo should be on the death certificate rather than cancer because it's you know even they admit it's a it's a brutal procedure 
I shall say brutal when I'm tempted to say barbaric, but let's just say brutal. But yeah, I, I, I just think until they just really start to realize that it's a mitochondrial disease rather than a, a, a genetic disease, I don't think they're going to have a great deal of success. Right. I agree 100%. Yeah, I think that all the research is going in the wrong direction. They're, they're concentrating too much on the genetic aspect. And uh, yeah, but, uh, you know, the reason I find I found it so important to talk to you is because I would like to see many more people who have cancer to actually uh, go either on a carnivore or keto diet or at the very least not to cut out meat. Because what I see so often that uh, people who get a cancer diagnosis, one of the first things they do is go on the Ger Gerson diet, which is, I believe, like vegan or, 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 or nearly vegan. And I think this is really the worst approach one can do. And I think we would see many more such stories like with your mom, with your mom uh, of people you know, either getting better with cancer or, or possibly even completely eliminating it, we don't know, uh, if they just ate meat, right? And, um, and uh, yeah, and I think it's so important to also bust that myth um, that meat is, uh, supposedly causes cancer. And this is all thanks to those uh, fraudulent epidemio epidemiological studies which just completely confuse people and just spread this rumor that meat causes cancer, meat causes cancer, like, run for your life, oh my god, like, the first thing you want to do when you get diagnosed with cancer is just cut out all meat, that's the most important thing. And it's like nothing could be further from the truth because people who have cancer uh, especially in the late stages, they get uh, incredibly em emaciated, uh, very weak, low energy, and if you deprive those people of the most nutrient-rich food, which is meat, it's like really just fueling that fire, that fueling that 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 sickness, and and um, so th this is really tragic. So I really I really hope that um, you know with, with uh, with such stories that you know more people will rethink that that programming really that is going on. Um, sure, I think um, I I think um, it's very interesting at the moment with people like David Clerfeld, Professor David Clerfeld, coming out and who was on the WHO committee, you know, the World Health Organization committee when they they made this this strange ruling that um, that meat causes cancer. And he's doing interviews now saying it was one of the most frustrating times of his professional career and it was absolute nonsense and it was driven by the whole Seventh-day Adventist agenda and all the vegans and vegetarians on the committee cherry-picking the data. And that's probably done untold harm because everybody's so terribly terrified of cancer and they'll, they'll ignore the meat. And I think, you know, this Gerson therapy and the veganism and stuff, I, I, when, I, when I was first diagnosed, I, because I've been vegetarian, pretty much on and off little gaps for 30 odd years with bits of veganism as well. I mean, my first, in 2010 this was, my first um, thought was to go incredibly vegan. And like so many people, you know, and all the juicing and spinach and God knows what, they gave me kidney stones and all of that sort of thing. But initially you kind of get results because it's a bit of a starvation diet, you know, until the oxalates build up and until the nutrient deficiencies hit, it's, it's rather um, a, a, a sort of a fasting diet, really, isn't it? You know, and I think if you want to fast, it would probably be better to just, you know, on diagnosis, do a massive great water fast and, uh, and then go on to carnivore <laughs> or even probably just go straight on to carnivore. You might not even need to do any fasting if you go straight on to carnivore. But the amount of fasting I did and, and, and juicing and, and I did see some benefits, but they, they're, they're very short lived. And so I think the Gerson therapy and things like that rely on that kind of short lived thing. I'd like to see people who say they have fixed their cancer on Gerson therapy. I'd like to see them a few years down the road. And see what's happened you know whereas the people who go carnivore and do it that way a few years down the road they just seem to be getting better and better and stronger and stronger so you know right 
Well, the Gerson diet, uh, I mean, it's it's not just a diet. This is what many people don't see. Like it's uh, uh, because when you go on the Gerson program, you're supposed to take a whole bunch of different supplements. Uh, among them, I believe, uh, vitamin B supplements. And also what they espouse, what they're big fans of is ozone treatments, ozone therapy. And, you know, ozone alone, uh, there are reports of people who have um, gotten rid of their cancer or put it in remission just by doing ozone, okay? So that alone uh, could be could be actually the, the factor. Plus, you know, when you go on the Gerson diet, you also cut out sugars, and this is huge, you know, just cutting out sugars, right? So you, you, you basically, you, you eliminate, by, just by doing this, you eliminate a big chunk of uh, any inflammatory processes in your body, and probably, uh, you know, one of the main foods to cancer, you just cut that out by cutting out sugar. So, uh, yeah, so, so I, you know, I totally can see that it, it will give some effects to people, you know, that it will help some people. But, uh, yeah, long term, I don't see, I don't see that uh, as a viable option. And you also hear that many people... Uh, okay, you know what, I remember, okay, years ago I met someone and she was also diagnosed with, with cancer. She went on the Gerson diet and did also um, um, others, um, other things. The cancer started uh, getting smaller, but she found the diet so incredibly restrictive, right? So she said, no, I can't do this. I can't continue uh, with this diet. And she started eating like normally again, right? And she said, I'd rather face the risk of the cancer growing back and killing me than continuing on the diet. You know, yeah, so it's, it's, it's not very fulfilling, I have to say. I mean, God, I, I remember when I was doing all that veganism and I thought, well, if it does cure me, I'm just going to have to give up the enjoyment of food forever because there was really nothing I could... Well, the only thing that I really used to enjoy was the smoothies in the morning where I used to make them with tons of coconut milk, um, a whole bag of spinach, almonds that had been soaked overnight, avocados, tons of bananas, cardamom, turmeric, honey. It was a sugar and oxalate bomb. Of course, it tasted fantastic. I mean, it tasted like a McDonald's milkshake. <laughs> it was great, but it was it really poisoned me. And, you know... <laughs> A couple of years later, when I was bent over the uh, accident and emergency counter in Granada in Spain with my son translating in tremendous agony with a massive kidney stone stuck in my ureter, I didn't realize it was to do with all that spinach at the time. But, um, you know, with the turmeric and the almonds and the spinach every single day, I was probably getting close to a lethal dose of, of spinach smoothies. <laughs> And, and, you know, it's, that was nice. But everything else in the day was like, oh, God, OK, I've got this, these raw vegetables. And I've got, oh, isn't it lovely? You know, and I can't put too much olive oil on it because <clears throat> it's so dangerous. You know, and, oh, it was absolutely ridiculous. I, I, I don't know because I'd, I'd studied diet for so long. And, and so many people, however much they've studied it, get caught up in this. I like it now because <clears throat> if, you, if you look on YouTube or if you Google around, it's not that difficult to find some really good information on uh, ketogenic diets, on carnivore. You know, it pops up now. But even back, even only nine years ago in 2010, it was, it was difficult to dig out. You know, most of the things were sort of David Avocado Wolf talking about this and that, you know, and you'd come across this sort of thing. And very few things were popping up about, about um, ketogenic diets, particularly not about carnivore. Paleo was just sort of getting, getting going. Um, but, yeah, I think for me it was discovering um, Natasha Campbell McBride, you know, in her GAPS diet and whatever. And that was that was when I finally started to nourish my emaciated, skinny body again, you know, having having lost about ninety pounds with the with the whole um, um, vegan juicing and fasting cycle, where I got frightened of food because every time I ate any, not only did it taste disgusting, but it caused inflammation as well. <laughs> it's kind of kind of funny to look back on it now but it was hell at the time um but i you know I, i'm 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 really happy to have been through it so i can i can understand what people have been through because I've, I've made every mistake in the book to be honest <laughs> well my vegan career 
<laughs> lasted for two or maybe top three weeks. And after oh. that, I like the first week or two weeks, I was feeling amazing on, on the vegan diet. I Back then, I used to live on, on a, I think it was a fourth floor walk up in Brooklyn. And I was just flying up those stairs. I was like, oh, the energy. Oh, my God. This is amazing. Right? And then uh, by week three, I was just, I had no energy at all. It was like, I was feeling like, like a zombie, like a dead man walking. I was like, okay, this is not working out for me. So, um, so that, that's like two or three weeks. That, that's, it, it's been like more than 10 years ago, so I don't remember exactly. But yeah, just like not even a full month. That, that's the extent of my vegan career, as I call it. But, um, well, okay, well done. <laughs> but uh, one uh, interesting thing that, that you mentioned is um, uh, what you were speculating that the iodine may have helped uh, to push out oxalates uh, in your mom's body. And what is an interesting, I don't know whether you read it, but there, there was something that Sally K. Norton uh, posted once on her Instagram. Uh, there, there's research that they found oxalates in basically every breast cancer tissue they examined. So I saw that. Right. So that, She's great. Yeah. So there may be a, a, a strong connection, you know, maybe this, even maybe some causative link, you know, maybe oxalates even contributes to... To, to the genesis of, of, of tumors, right? We don't know. I'm sure they do. They get in everywhere, don't they? And, and you know, I, don't, I hadn't even heard of them back then. I didn't understand about oxalates. I didn't understand about deuterium. I, it's just, you know, there's all these factors that you look at that might, might have had an effect or, or, or combined might have caused it. You know, some people are probably fine at eliminating oxalates or much better than others. You know, who knows what it was with my mum. It's, it's, but the good thing is every single thing that seems to deplete oxalates, deplete deuterium, get rid of inflammation, um, they all seem to be the same things. Okay, what is deuterium? Can you explain? I, I... Okay, deuterium, deuterium is, um, it's an extra, it's, it's an, an extra isotope on hydrogen. So instead of becoming H2O, it's D2O, which is like heavy water, and it makes the molecule very heavy and big. And so basically, to, to, to simplify it, it, it blocks up the mitochondria, stops them spinning, the engines blow up, and so the cells malfunction. And if you get enough of this happening in enough cells, uh, cancer comes they find you find it i mean if you if you listen to some wonderful interviews with uh, laszlo boros I, I love laszlo it's great it's his birthday today actually and he's a drummer like me but he's he's one of the um he, he's one of the top leading um deuterium researchers in the world and some of his talks are amazing and he fixed his own cancer <clears throat> i'm sorry his cancer fixed itself <laughs> while he was coincidentally doing this depletion of deuterium. So, um, yeah, when his twin brother died from his, when he went for, for the conventional treatment, um, which was interesting at both doctors. So, um, yeah, if, if you, um, if you lower the deuterium levels in the body, then a lot of these things seem to go away. Uh, the chronic diseases now um, because we are mostly water we need that water to be as good as possible and a lot of the the, the whole planet really is higher deuterium if you like than it was <clears throat> in our paleolithic days um, for, for, for many reasons but and our food is now irrigated with high deuterium water you know and so so the grains become even higher in deuterium and the higher deuterium foods are seeds you know of plants the sort of reproductive cycle of plants is the most is the highest in deuterium so all these beans and legumes and seeds and grains and stuff they're just deuterium bombs so we're filling ourselves with that um <clears throat> actually the body creates its own water this is the function of the mitochondria they, that it creates its own water and the way to to make it create its own deuterium depleted water is to eat a lot of saturated fat and saturated fat actually hydrates us in the same way that a camel is hydrated by the fat in its hump 
You know, this is so a lot of people maybe think there's water in a camel's hump or something. No, but it's full of fat and that's how they hydrate themselves and they don't, they don't, um, um, you know, dehydrate in the desert. So a similar process goes on in our cells and everything again, everything that is a disconnect with our ancestral heritage is something that raises deuterium eating fruit out of season. The sun you just got to look at nature, really. You know, the sun depletes deuterium. You get a load of sun, it depletes deuterium in the body. Um, when does fruit come out? When it's sunny or in sunnier climes. So we're designed to eat it then in season when it comes off the trees. But if you're in England and you're eating bananas and mangoes in the middle of winter while you're watching Netflix all night, you know, this is a serious ancestral disconnect and probably enough to give you cancer even if you're, e e even if you're eating a fully carnivore diet. I don't know. So it's all of these things at once and depending on, on each person's tolerance and each person's sort of like I often put it, the bucket of ill health, you know, that gets that gets filled up with many different things, emotional stuff, the light, the whatever. But all of these things staying up late, you know, deuterium is depleted in our sleep. So if you're if you're 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 filling yourself full of blue light before you go to bed telling the body it's dawn, then it's not sleeping properly, then it's not depleting the deuterium. And, you know, it goes on and on. It, it's, it, to me, it's just very, very simple of just look at nature. I love it when the science comes out that actually ties in with nature. This is why I love the work of Dr. Jack Cruz, because however deep he gets into the crazy science, he's always saying, if it doesn't tally up with nature, I'm not interested. You know, he's just trying to explain how nature works instead of just bringing up some kind of weird hypothesis and trying to prove it on mice under artificial light in a lab, which just doesn't reflect nature. And it certainly doesn't reflect human physiology. So, you know, anyway, that's that's deuterium. It's if, if, if anybody there's a there's a podcast with um, Luke Story on his lifestylist podcast with Laszlo Boros. And it's like three hours long. But I'd say if anybody wants to understand about deuterium, that he's funny, he's entertaining. Uh, the, the, the whole three hours will have you kind of switching it off every five minutes and trying to digest. Oh, my God, that makes sense. You know, he, he, it really blows you away. The, the implications of what might be coming from um, um, too much deuterium in the body. Okay, so let's talk now a little bit about your story with uh, psori psori psoriatic uh, uh, arthritis. No, sorry, psoriatic arthritis. Yeah, sorry, yeah. Psoriatic arthritis. <laughs> um, yeah, um, yeah. So let's talk about this. Like, what were your symptoms? How bad was it? And um, when did you do the switch from vegan or vegetarian to a carnivore diet? And how did your symptoms improve on the carnivore diet? Sure. Um, well, when I look at it, I thought that in sort of September, October 2010, I had a sudden downturn in my health. <laughs> when one ankle blew up really fat and I could hardly walk on it. And then a couple of weeks later, the other ankle did. <clears throat> and then I think the same week, the knee did the left knee and I thought god that was sudden but when I actually look back it was starting in the mid 80s you know and I'd have these sort of problems in my sacroiliac joints and then in the early 90s when I used to have to put my wrist in the bucket of ice in between sets when I was playing drums and um, that was that was obviously that I was diagnosed as um, Kinebox disease where the lunate bone crumbles, but it wasn't and, and luckily it wasn't diagnosed as psoriatic arthritis because back then I'd probably have taken their medications and, and been in a terrible state today um, So it would come and go over the years in various forms, you know, I'd have a bad back all the time I was always at chiropractors uh, started to put on a load of weight and I ended up sort of 2010 about well I, I ran a gym in the late 90s and I was I was pretty muscly and really in shape but could never get really lean because I was still you know force fed the idea of, of carbohydrates and how we it's calories in calories out so I was you know riding a mountain bike hours a day doing my cardio training a lot and still never got lean couldn't understand how anybody did it but I understand now if I <laughs> If I if I'd have known then what I know now, I could have uh, I, I could have been very different. But then you know all these little whispers added up, and by the uh, by the late noughties, you know, so sort of like two thousand and seven, eight, nine, I was pretty overweight. I hadn't trained for quite a long time. I didn't have um, 
anywhere near the muscle I had sort of 10 years previously. But I weighed more than I did back then. Um, you know, I was like 210 pounds or something like that. And um, things just things just weren't going right. I had fatty liver. I had cysts on the liver. I had some cysts on the kidneys and calcifications here and there. All sorts of digestive issues, skin issues, rosacea. Um, now, I didn't ever get psoriasis as such. I did kind of later on after the joints uh, came in. It wasn't so much psoriasis, something called pomphollics, where the the hand palm of the hand starts sort of going into little blisters and and sort of like it looks like it's decomposing it was it was horrible um <clears throat> that used to come mostly as a reaction to my my massive intake of uh, ibuprofen you know <laughs> which was destroying my gut as well along with the um what do you call them the the um, proton pump inhibitors you know to to stop the acid reflux which everybody experiences who who eats as much um, pasta and hagen das at 11 o'clock at night as I did. <laughs> and so, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't surprising that everything went wrong. <clears throat> but it seemed very sudden. And so in 2010, I thought, right, that's it. Big detox, veganism. I need all these supplements. I must be lacking in this, lacking in that. I need to force the toxins out of my body. I need to, you know, all these kind of cliches. Even though I'd written a book in 96 on, on diet and Ayurveda and, you know, yogic breathing and exercise and things like that, I still realized that um, after a while that I really didn't know very much. I didn't really know very much about Ayurveda, which I since, since found out says that meat is the most healing and the most nourishing substance for the human body. If you dig deeply in the texts, it's not about all that vegetarian nonsense. So anyway, yeah, then I, I went vegan and, and the weight started to fall off. It was fat, but it was muscle as well. And by sort of 2011, uh, well, <clears throat> spring 2011 fell off pretty quickly. I started to get quite emaciated and I got down to something like 120 pounds, I think. And um, yeah, it was, it, there was mixed results. You know, I got rid of some of the fatty liver. I think I was doing a lot of liver flushing, you know, that, that, um, kind of Epsom salt and, and olive oil thing. And I think I've done like more than 40 of those now and I really went for it. It was, it was the only three days of the month where I was inflammation free unless I did a fast. And so I used to look forward to it. That was my high point. You know, the complications that I went through to try and get rid of this inflammation, I would have a program early in the day of, of, of sort of three hours where I was in the bathroom doing all kinds of um, <clears throat> Epsom salt baths, enemas, this and that, you know, all sorts of nonsense. God knows what I did to my gut flora back then, <coughs> pumping all these sort of things into myself. And, 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 you know, it didn't really have any lasting benefit. And then, and then I decided, well, okay, even juicing and, and, and raw veganism isn't enough, so I decided to go fruitarian. <laughs> it's just ridiculous. So anyway, the first couple of days were great. Yeah, I can binge on all this sugar. I can eat, you know, 10 pineapples or something. Oh, my God. Eventually, my teeth hurt too much to chew anything, really, and, and, and I had so much brain fog. I didn't, I didn't know where I was. And I discovered Natasha Campbell McBride's stuff and Jack Cruz's stuff at around the same time. So I went on this fish fast for a week and all of my mental faculties came back again. You know, I mean, I was so bad. I was walking into rooms. I didn't know where I was. I was sort of overflowing sinks. I was burning pans trying to cook, you know, it, it just, it, it was terrible when I was cooking for the kids and, and they'd have to come in and say, you know, another pan's on fire or something. <laughs> it's like burned to the bottom and smoke alarms going off and, yeah so then all ever all my all my my mental faculties came back it was incredible it was like being a different person the, explain fish fast what well i ate nothing i just ate nothing but fish basically i just i just ate tins of sardines for a week <laughs> and suddenly everything came back because jack crew is very hot on seafood particularly for sort of neurological stuff and um it worked and from then on, I kind of experimented with keto diets and, and GAPS diets. And um, when I got fully established in it, then I got really bad kidney stones, which often happens. And I blamed it on the meat. I thought, oh, my God, I've had meat for like three months. And so I've, I've got kidney stones. Well, of course, it wasn't that. 
It's just that there's an oxalate dump, isn't there? When you get rid of the, the oxalate foods. I didn't realize that back then, but because the joints had stopped hurting, I thought, well, if I have to deal with the odd kidney stone, at least I can walk, you know, I, what the hell? So, you know, out the frying pan into the fire, as we say. Um, but, but after a while, these things all calmed down. But what amazed me was 20, well, 2013, 2014, I'd pretty much got the inflammation out enough to train again and managed to put back some muscle. I, I was pretty much on a, on a, a low starch, not so much low sugar, but low st I, I always found starchy things hurt me much more than the sugar. So I would be all right with say, seriously, a bar of chocolate, but I wouldn't be all right with some broccoli and a sweet potato. <laughs> Not that I wasn't, uh, you know, I'd have like a, a monthly binge on chocolate or something. I'd have a load where I'd think, just give me a load of chocolate. And it, I'd think it's going to hurt. And it actually didn't. I wouldn't do it every day or anything. But I, I just, I could just couldn't do the veg. And eventually I thought, no, forget the veg. I'd managed to put on quite a bit of muscle again. But I was doing um, honey, double cream and berries, like buckets of it a day when i found i could take dairy again and i started putting on a load of weight back on and because i was so emaciated i loved it i thought well hey you know i'm putting on weight again and maybe got to about 160 170 pounds again and i thought oh this is brilliant you know i can train i put a load of muscle back on i've 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 you know i'm not so skinny but i, I still i wasn't feeling that brilliant um until 2015 when i, I just thought you you know what the days where i can't be bothered to cook any vegetables I'm feeling better than other days. Mental clarity is better. Um, yeah, I didn't have any overt um, inflammation in the joints, just little twinges here and there. They were a bit stiff, that kind of thing, you know, no agony or anything. Um, <clears throat> interestingly, one thing I didn't mention was <clears throat> 2013, we moved out of a big house that we were living in with my mum. She had like the middle floor. We had the top floor. She had the bottom floor. And my ankles were still bad. They were the worst of all the joints when the pain was there. It was terrible. I, I, I couldn't, I could barely walk some days. And when I moved out from my living with my mum, she's very difficult to live with, actually. She's, she's a very, like the sort of incarnation of disapproval, you know. She had, I think a lot of her repressed emotions and bottling stuff up probably had a lot to do with that not opening of the heart and, 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 uh, and that breast cancer as well. The, the emotional connection, all of these things go hand in hand, I think. But it was funny when I was getting really, really to the end of my tether. And I've looked after her for 10 years. I've been in the same house and I moved out and the ankles healed up within two weeks. It was incredible. While the while other joints were still completely affected and I never had the slightest twinge from my ankles since. But anyway, certain other joints were, were still a, a bit of a problem. But in 2015, you know, when I discovered the carnivore thing, I was just glad to see the back of the vegetables. I, I, you know, I miss really buttery potatoes, I think, and fries, you know, with tons of butter on them. I think everybody's got to love that. But, you, you know, those starchy green vegetables and leaves and things, I'm, I'm glad to see the back of them. I, I never liked them anyway, and most of them just rotted in the fridge. So um, now absolutely no plant matter and, and life is so easy. It's so easy to cook. It's, you know... If you have to miss a meal sometime, you, you don't get caught out overly hungry, do you ever? You don't think, I've got to eat something. I've got to, you know, I, my energy's great. I'm 57 now and I can, uh, <coughs> I can play uh, really long gigs on the drums and people much younger than me are sort of after the gig, they're going, oh, I'm starving, oh, I'm knackered, I'm ready for bed. And I'm like, I could do it again. <laughs> it's, it's fantastic. So, um, yeah, it's, it's a real revelation what happens when when you drop all those healthy veg out but yeah there we go <laughs> how about your wrist do you ever have to soak it in ice water after a gig no 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 but you can see that uh this this is my good wrist right that bends from there to there this is my bad wrist from when it was inflamed i could barely even move it i couldn't move it more than about this I had it all wrapped up and bandaged. I, I couldn't. I, I couldn't even pull the covers up at night. You know, I had to do it with my other hand. And when I started to drum, it was it was still quite painful <clears throat> back in like 2013. But now I'd lost all the movement in it. But now I've got this movement back completely. Uh, this movement, I don't know if it'll ever come back. That's as much as it bends. But no inflammation. I tell you what, if you have arthritis in a in a, in a joint, you don't do that with it. You'll be screaming. So. <laughs> 
you know, no, no inflammation. But yeah, it's a bit, it's a bit wedged there. Maybe I could really work on it and get some more movement back. I don't know. That's the one joint, but that's been affected since the early nineties, you know, so there's bound to be some damage in there, but I don't notice it at all. When I play, I never have any pain or discomfort from it. And I never need to put it in a bucket of ice water. No, never. So, um, yeah. Can you eat dairy products? I can, but I had an interesting experience um, early this year when, where are we? It was probably January, something like that, when um, my partner was diagnosed with Graves' disease. So we went on, a, you know, we consulted with uh, Joffier Clements at Paleo Medicina. Graves' disease, that's a hypo, um, um, uh, the thyroid disease, right? Yeah, it's hyperthyroid rather than hypo. And, and it's, you know, the heart rate's up massively her heart rate was like 130 beats per minute and that kind of thing and she got very emaciated suddenly and she started to get that bulgy eye thing and uh very tired and bit of a lump here goiter coming up and we we put her on a carnivore diet a very high fat carnivore diet and uh we at its early stage of that this is where medicine comes in it is very dangerous the heart can kind of blow up you know so we thought okay let's we'll take a, a small amount of these meds but she tapered off them incredibly quickly and um and and the thyroid levels come came down ridiculously fast and the weight came back on as soon as we got it and she wasn't even eating anything that was too much out of the ordinary you know much less than most people she was eating um uh, she was having the odd sort of like non-alcoholic beer she was drinking and she was having fruit juice and she was having uh, fruit and that was it. No vegetables, but just eliminating those made the most enormous difference. It, it was it was incredible. And um, and yeah, she's well on the mend. But because we were chatting to Jofia, I don't know if you're familiar with paleo medicina and their, their paleolithic ketogenic diet and whatever. Anyway, I was chatting to Jofia and. Uh, we were both on Skype and, and she said, look, with thyroid issues, you cannot have any dairy. I mean, no dairy. And I was the only dairy I was having was butter and I was covering everything in butter. You know, I'd have, um, you know, a steak and I'd put great big wadges of it all over it. Now, I thought, yeah, I'm fine with it. I don't have any problems in the joints. But then I said to her, OK, because she said, went, oh, not butter as well. It was the only <laughs> thing. It was like, oh, no. <laughs> I said, well, I tell you what, we'll swap out butter for tallow and I'll go with you and I won't, you know, we won't have any butter around to, to get tempted and, and, and I'll pack it in with you. Um, I didn't think I needed to. I was blown away. I mean, the last of the fat I had on me disappeared, which has revealed that even though I put muscle on in 2013, 2014, I'm still too skinny now. So I'm getting into some training now because I have no way now with just the tallow it seems of putting on any weight apart from you know just staying really lean and the only way i can put on weights to put on muscle now you stay so lean without the dairy some it keeps some people a little bit of fat i was I, by that time by early this year i was never fat or anything but you know you couldn't quite see the abs and now they're kind of popping out a bit and it's 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 amazing um and that's with no exercise and also some um, sinus problems cleared up that i'd had over the winter where i just blamed it on the um on the central heating you know when it dries out the sinuses and whatever but no uh that seemed to clear up and a few other things and i i'm i'm blown away i mean i i think our probably our optimal diet doesn't include dairy but hey if you can take it that's fine you, you know the only way you're going to really know what it does is to drop it out completely for 30 days or so and then and then reintroduce it and you 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 tell me you know some people say they don't notice anything that's absolutely fine go ahead you know eat all the all the runny cheeses you can if i could eat a baked camembert every day i would it's delicious but but is it optimal for me no i don't think so i don't think even butter is so i, I don't have any well <clears throat> I'll, I'll have a bit every now and again, like uh, some friends came around and, and they brought some fantastic raw cream. <clears throat> I couldn't resist it, you know, but only once in a blue moon now and again. It's it's pretty much just meat and tallow and a bit of fish and some liver for me now and egg yolks. I found egg whites were also a bit of a problem. Um, that's it, really. Yeah. Yeah, I made a similar experience. So um, I also had I, I still have psoriasis. I don't have any outbreaks. Because I he, I have them 100% on control with, with the diet, but what I noticed so um, I went carnivore last year. It was March last year, 
But before that, I had been paleo for nine or ten years. And um, so during all the time, during the past ten years, I, uh, I haven't had a single um, outbreak of psoriasis. And before that, I used to have um, like those um, inflamed, itchy red patches here in my, uh, on my lids and here on the side and here on my shoulders and, and here. Like, like Goji Man. Like who? Like what? Like, like Goji Man. Oh, I don't know. Who is. He's the guy. He's the guy who, who who's supposed to cure everybody with his vegan protocols. <laughs> and then if you zoom in, he's got a load of psoriasis and stuff around here. Anyway, carry on, poor old Goji Man. I don't know. Um, <laughs> yeah. So um, so yeah. So I didn't have um, I didn't have any patches for ten years, right? And then, as I said, I went carnivore March two thousand eighteen. But by August, September, October 2018, I started eating dairy again. And I didn't, I didn't eat any dairy in all those 10 years prior to that, okay? Because on paleo, you, you don't eat dairy. And I also knew that dairy wasn't good for me. Uh, but, but then I thought, okay, you know, maybe something changed. Maybe some healing took place. I don't know. And also, I was doing a, a mercury chelation program. So I thought, you know... Hey, and dairy is, is carnivore, so let's have some dairy. And so I started with the hard cheeses, right? And then, um, and then, crap, my dad's calling. Uh, okay, sorry. Um, so I started with the hard cheeses, and then by December, January, so December 2018, January 2019, I was chugging cream, like, you know, like, half a liter to a liter of cream every day I was, yeah, like, I, I was completely hooked on dairy i was like it makes that stuff is addictive right so so i don't know what part of that whether it was the 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 the, the sugar the lactose that's in there or, or, or something else in the dairy but the patches started coming back and i and i had again i had patches here on my Eyes, you know, those they're, they're always like red and 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 um, kind of coarse when you rub over them, and I hadn't had those for ten years, okay. And now when I started eating dairy again, like well, eating, it's, it's uh, it was really like chugging, like really stuffing my face with dairy. You know, it all uh, it all came back, and so I realized, okay. Dairy is not good for me, and I also realized, you know what, I still have psoriasis. I just keep it under control, and, and I'm perfectly fine with it. But uh, but it was really important for me to um, to learn that, yeah, dairy is really off the table. So, yeah. Absolutely. Well, it did. Shafir was saying we we just had this um, carnival retreat in Spain, you know, and Shafir was there, and 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 she was saying that even a few molecules can trigger a response when you're sensitive to something you know so so that's why she's saying when people say is ghee okay oh there's nothing left in it but of course there is you know there's there's something left in it. some people might be fine with it and and you know people all have just they're okay at a different scale so when people say you know what's carnivore and what isn't i just, you know it, it's a funny old term, isn't it? Like like these diagnoses, we have to put a label on something. I, I just think, well, I, I just eat what doesn't react with my body and makes me feel the best. Uh, I'll go with the label carnivore because that's what everybody's calling it. But it's it's I just call it just like basic. You know, you just eat some basic ancestral food and that's what we do. It's have a have a look at a cave painting and see what they're depicting. And if it's not in it, then it, it, it's probably not going to be your basic food and it's going to be something that might react to you. You know, I would say their highly prized foods were probably the ones that were most nourishing for the body. And it's, you know, it's one guy and one spear and one mammoth. And it's, it's a bit of a clue for us, isn't it, I think? <laughs> How about pork? Do you eat pork? Uh, yeah, well, it, I, I, I do sometimes. Again, I, it, I don't think it's optimal because it's always been fed rubbish. I think any animal that's been fed really what it's supposed to eat, but it's difficult to feed pigs and bring them up commercially, eating what they actually eat, you know, foraging around and eating whatever they find. Um, so uh, it, particularly in England, you know, it's very inflammatory. 
the the meat of pork a bacon less so it seems the cured meats are less so it takes out whatever it is that makes it inflammatory there's a i forget exactly what it is there's a good article on zero carb zen about pork and says exactly why it causes a problem why people have more problems with fresh pork i seem to have less problems with say the crackling you know the skin and that's probably one of the most delicious things in the world isn't it and so we we get you, you can go down to the to, to the butcher here and get get it free because people are frightened of fat and they don't want to eat the crackling so they just give you great big sheets of it with the fat on the back you know of the pig skin and just put it in the oven and roast it with loads of salt and it's just absolutely delicious Heavenly. i don't seem to have a problem with that but i don't buy pork joints anymore i don't buy fresh pork because i do tend to react to that and chicken i think is the same because it's just fed rubbish you know i i would love to find a chicken that's actually really been allowed to roam without having a load of corn thrown at it as well so if you have a chicken that you know they're little dinosaurs aren't they they're little, little velociraptors and and they they rip mice to bits and worms and beetles and that's what they're supposed to eat and if you can find one that's eaten eaten all that then great now jofia paleo medicine she often says to people yes pork is fantastic because it's so fatty it's it's really high in uh, in all the fats that you need you know to heal and yeah probably the mangalits of pork or whatever they have over there is is completely different to what we have here so it, it entirely depends on how it's been brought up and, and i did say to her when when we were when um, some one conversation i had with her i was saying look you know what about this english pork it's really fed a load of rubbish and stuff and she said yeah yeah it's probably best to avoid it and just stick with the ruminant animals so you know i even even the so-called factory farmed cattle are really only fed that stuff for the last three months of their life so most of their lives they're on they're on grass and they have you know that ruminant stomach where they can turn pretty much anything into into good meat and so much as i wish everything was grass fed and we were restoring the land as it should be uh, that isn't the case so people are, are healing up beautifully on the on the cheaper cuts of beef and whatever they can afford at the supermarket but i would say if somebody's got something inflammatory or something autoimmune i would say yeah to avoid pork and chicken probably as well yeah how many times a day do you eat um whenever i'm hungry and that's either once or twice so it, it depends it depends yeah how important do you think is it to eat organ meats Ooh. I don't know. I, I mean, uh, to be safe, I do eat some. I don't particularly like them. They're all right. Liver's okay. I can't take kidneys. They just, they, you know, your whole house smells of piss when you're cooking them. I can't take it, really. It's uh, revolting. But, you know, I'm sure they're great to eat. Um, my, my partner has been getting into more. I mean, she grew up in Tanzania. She was 20 years vegetarian. But when she came out of being a vegetarian, she, she didn't go for the you know a little bit of bacon and a little bit of salmon or something like most ex-vegans she was straight into the uh, fish heads and the chicken carcasses all the bones you know when we'd finished with them back when i was eating the chicken and she'd be scrunching away on the bones the whole thing would disappear and she'd have all buying bone marrow and organs and everything you know i think one of her first meals was a load of liver and i thought whoa well done coming back straight you know from 20 years vegetarian but she grew up in tanzania where they know how to eat animals nose to tail is it important i don't know i mean i eat some to be safe i eat some fish to be safe if i didn't have to eat fish and and organ meats i'd be quite happy about that i wouldn't miss them you know i could probably eat um good good grass-fed burgers with um <clears throat> tallow tipped over them and a load of runny egg yolks for every single meal for the rest of my life it's just so delicious <clears throat> but but could we uh some people you know they seem to be fine some of the long-term carnivores nowadays they seem to be fine i mean look at the anderson family 20 years on ribeye steaks they look incredible i don't know i don't know again some people might be more efficient at getting the nutrients that they need out of the muscle meat and some people might need a, a more a more dense form of, of nutrients like you find in the organs you know we've got we've got all sorts of things lying around in the freezer we've got a few brains and all kinds of things at the moment um um but yeah I, I i'd like to get away without them to be honest but i try to get the kids to get a few bites of them every now and again i don't think you need much 
You know, I, I think Frank Tofano might have a good point on this and Paul Saladino and whatever. I think they, they might have some good points that just, you know, eat as much as you can and, 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 and which, which might, it, you know, which might not even be to take it. But it's, it's funny when you eat liver, you eat a little bit and, and you kind of it. the first couple of bites are quite nice, I find. But then it's like, well, I've had enough of that. The body's probably had enough nutrients, but I could then go and eat a steak fine. So I have it as a, like an intro sometimes, like a little um, aperitif or whatever, um, or, or some oysters. You know, I don't like fish very much, so and I only take it as medicine. So I think, well, I might as well eat oysters, which, are, I can, you know, to me, they're pretty revolting. I don't, I don't, you know, first of all, when you eat your first few, you think, oh, that's disgusting. Now, I don't mind them at all. I just chew them up, swallow them. I don't think anything of it. It's just, you know, salty bogeys or whatever. But it's it's not um, it's it's not something I would want to make a whole meal out of. But every now and again, you see, my body tells me what at one day I, I'll think I need some liver. It's not quite a hunger. It's almost like your body says I need some liver and and I'll have a little bit or some days I think I've really got to go down to the fishmonger. I hope he's got some oysters in and we'll get a bunch of oysters and, and eat a load of them. And then we'll forget about it for a couple of weeks or a month. Um, <clears throat> I don't know. I just, I just think if you listen to your body after you've been on these kind of very basic reset diets for a long time, your body has subtler signals and, and it'll tell you what you need. Do you need them? Does everybody need them? I don't know whether there's actually that kind of prescription. I, I don't know. don't know. Just, just go with the flow as long as you yeah. eat something from from an animal. So, uh, how is your um, girlfriend doing with the Graves disease? Is she does she have the symptoms under control? Is she off the medication or what's the status? She's down onto really mi minimal medication now. Very quickly, she's still on a little bit. Um, yes, the, the the thyroid hormones came back down. She's. She has the occasional slip up. When we were in Spain, we were in the um, staying in a good friend Lynn Hardy's villa, who was the, my, my co-organizer out there, and she'd um, kindly lent us one of her beautiful villas that she has out there. And uh, <laughs> Detta was uh, my my partner was um, was going on a couple of chocolate binges out there. She went, "Oh well, I'm on holiday. I'll have a bit of chocolate. It won't do any harm." And Jofia spotted it in the fridge, you know, and she was like that's going to be a problem. And sure enough, when we got back, the, the, the thyroid hormones had shot up, even despite the medication. So, and it was only like a couple of days slip with a couple of big bars of chocolate or something. And it's fascinating to see how, you know, because most people, if, if you said to the endocrinologist, right, look at these results, he did say, actually, this is very good. This is very fast that this has all come down. But he would have just said, oh, it's just the medication. But she was on exactly the same medication, had a couple of bars of chocolate, and her thyroid hormones went up again. I mean, it was like the T3, I think, the the free T3 or whatever was something like 98, was really high. And then she went on the medication and uh, it, it, the, the PKD diet, and it came down right within range, something like 10 or something. And after a little bit of a chocolate binge, back to 33. Fascinating. And then back, and then back onto no chocolate, thyroid hormones down again. So it just shows that the amount of crap that most people are eating, they're probably doing worse than she did for two days, every single day. And so they have to take barrages of medication to keep it down. And so the docs go, diet doesn't matter. Because, of course, they're not seeing anybody actually eating a really high-fat meat diet. And, and if you do, my God, everything seems to, seems to reverse, you know. She, uh, hopefully in the next little while she'll be able to taper off the meds completely. Um, as long as she stops having the chocolate binges but it's it was a really interesting experiment i think to have that chocolate binge because it was the only thing that she changed and suddenly the thyroid hormones tripled after maybe let's say three bars of chocolate yeah well, chocolate, amazing. Is, chocolate is supposed to be very high in oxalates so yeah this may have particularly particularly the dark chocolate that she was eating so you know and, and jofia did say that that the chocolate is also extremely bad for triggering thyroid problems so, you know, it, I, it's fascinating to me how little can actually trigger it once you've already done something like that. And, and, and people, that, people who maybe don't have a leaky gut, they're doing all these things and they don't notice any difference because their body's protecting them at the moment. 
so they go oh well it's okay and then all the docs say well diet doesn't work because some rheumatologist saw somebody give up bread for a week and their arthritis didn't get better and so they go oh well it doesn't matter you know you've got to do i don't like to say extreme but you you've got to go drastically basic you know for a reset if if you've got people say oh it's just another extreme diet i don't think it's an extreme diet it just cuts out all the triggers you know, if, you've, if you're sitting nicely in the middle of the seesaw eating all these seasonal foods minus grains, you'll probably never get sick. But if you're sick, the seesaw is all the way up here. You've got to go the other end to the carnivore thing. But people think it's going all the other way to veganism, but it's not. That's kind of going down the other, the same side of the seesaw. It's crazy. Um, so, yeah, you just got to balance it out for a bit, and then maybe you can come back in towards the middle. You know, some people reintroduce things, and they're fine, and some people don't and don't want to. I don't particularly want to. You know, I mean, if I could eat, if I could eat double cream honey and berries and um, white chocolate and potatoes with butter on all day long, I probably would. But those are the only things that I miss. There's nothing else that I miss, really. And, and when I say I miss them, it's so slight now. It's not like a consuming thing where I go, oh, I've got to go out and drive out in the middle of the night to get some fries from McDonald's or something, you know um there's there's no cravings like that it's just like it's the kids you know I, i'm not strict with them they eat mostly carnivore at home with a little bit of fruit um and if we go out to a restaurant or something and they want a bowl of fries absolutely fine go for it you know i'm not i'm not incredibly strict they they, they make their own choices they know what's going on and i do look at them sometimes and i think oh i could do a mouthful of those but you know anything else that people have all of these cereals grains breads pasta all of that stuff I, i'm i'm just it's completely gone all the all the desire is gone but i think that's probably because we're quite adapted to 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 root vegetables you know i think we probably dug them up since the beginning of time and ate them when we when we could and when we had to when we couldn't get the meat or just to go with the meat or whatever you know um and they're probably nowhere near so bad as spinach so yeah but so well, one more thing i wanted to go uh to your mom's story um for a second so when the cancer disappeared did you go back to the oncologist and if so what did he say to that yes i remember him saying um what did you do <laughs> it was great and he asked me i don't know it's funny uh, to to read into what these guys think because um, did, did you tell him what you did yeah sure i told him what we did all along you know i'm i'm a lot of people say i'll just go in and do what they say and then throw the meds away and then go home and no i'm a bit blabbermouth i'm a show off and i don't you know i love it i love going and challenging these people i i i love seeing their faces when something like that happens when they're sort of it blows their fuse a little bit you know um i i they, I don't know what he was thinking really because it would have been nice to follow it up for longer but because she died of the pneumonia um it was it, he didn't see the long-term progression of it and neither did i i mean i saw it pretty much disappear all the skin came back to normal I mean, the skin was so mashed up as you can see on the, on that video that i've got of it you, the skin was so mashed up like the nipple had gone everything and it kind of returned to normal the the outside skin even and on the inside it was all beautifully shrinking down um i i don't know where it would have ended up you see the thing is i think a lot of people who do actually reverse the process of cancer get left with the odd lump and they're not really a problem you know sometimes a tumor might shrink down to much smaller and then just stay there because maybe it the core of it is dense and impenetrable or the body doesn't think it's important or who knows i don't know but the lumps unless they're pressing against a vital organ are not the problem at all the 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 you know they're actually a good uh, indicator of how the process is going I, I i think the process is the the important thing to stop so you know um yeah i yeah it was difficult to track it really but so, he did but he did see that it was getting better yeah yeah he did yeah and yeah. so he was on board with that or did he criticize you they never really commit do they i mean the ne the nearest thing i saw to um to committing to something was actually her gastroenterologist once was when she started to get this terrible reflux it was a it was a probably a year or two before the diagnosis of the breast cancer but i knew <clears throat> well i know that she probably had it back then she just wasn't saying but 
she started to have these real bad reflux. She couldn't even take a mouthful of food, any food, without sort of running to the toilet and sort of having all these strings of gloopy horrendousness coming up. I mean, it was really horrific. And I thought, God, is there something really bad down there? Whatever. I better take her to the doctor. She's not going to uh, tolerate a camera down the throat. So we'll do, oh, okay, we'll do this barium swallow thing. Not very nice stuff, but at least you can take an x-ray from the outside. It's not very invasive. And they said, as they usually do, oh, you've got hiatus hernia, just as they said to me years ago. Um, and so I sat in front of this um, gastroenterologist guy, you know, who I'd heard of before. And he was, he had a reputation for being pretty strict and hard line. You know. I thought, we're going to have trouble with this dude. And I was sitting and I said, well, you know, I've fixed some psoriatic arthritis I've got. I had high hernia, so they said I have no problems now. I used to live on antacids and proton pump inhibitors. I never take anything like that now. Just really high, high fat, meaty diet, bone broth, stuff like that. Can we try this with my mum? You know, and anyway, my mum sort of interrupted me and said, because all, all, all parents think their kids are idiots, you know. And she sort of interrupted me and said to him, so what are you going to do about it? And, and, and he, he, he turned to her and he said, if you do exactly what your son says, you'll never need us at all. I was amazed. She was amazed. And so she actually listened to me and started doing it. And the reflux sorted itself out, you know. But we still had us on some of the veg and whatever, uh, which is what we cut when we got the cancer diagnosis. But she was actually pretty low carb up to that point anyway. Um, which completely fi fixed the digestive issues. Um, so that's the only one I've seen 100% on board, which was the one I was expecting to be the most problem and to really have a go at me and tell me I was an idiot. Um, but uh, the, the oncologist, yeah, I, I could see things in him where he was kind of turning around a bit. You know, I, I mean, I see things in here, endocrinologists now when I mentioned a carnivore diet before, on the first vi visit, said this is what we're planning and how, keep an eye. And, and he actually rolled his eyes like that. You know, just like, oh. <clears throat> and now he's not quite like that. He's saying, so I understand you're on this diet. You know, yeah. you see these little sort of um, changes in them when they see something like that happening. So, but the trouble is, it's so often it's um, masked by so much medication that they're not really sure what's doing what. So, you know, to be safe, they'll go, oh, well, it was the medication. And I think a lot of the times people heal despite the medications, not because of them. And so the medications take the credit when it's not the medication at all a lot of the time. So I, I, I don't know. You know, people are saying that a, a carnivore keto diet um, is, is fantastic for, for, for lessening the side effects of chemo. And some of the people who are doing the stem cell therapies are saying they really like it when they get people on a keto diet in because it all works so much quicker. Uh, you know people are noticing people are noticing so I, I i don't know i love it when the docs come around i love it there's a there's a, a local doc around here um joanne mccormack she's fantastic and and she gives all these low carb meetings and she has a twitter and website called fat is my friend i think and and she's lovely and she calls me in now and again and i'll, I'll go and chat if there's somebody with autoimmunity she's she's not 100 percent on board with the carnivore diet but she sees that perhaps it's a very powerful intervention in in autoimmunity but she deals mostly with diabetics you know and people with that sort of metabolic syndrome and whatever and of course a regular keto diet is or low carb diet is going to be fantastic and probably easily enough for that and so she's just doing wonders and, and i love it when they wake up because then they start to shout kind of louder than we do don't they because <laughs> they realize that their brainwashing was deep uh, and that's beautiful. So maybe I'll drop some little little bombs in that uh, that oncologist's mind. I don't know. Who knows? <laughs> yeah, I think this is this is great. I think this is very encouraging to hear that some doctors are actually open minded enough to to change their stance, because I think uh, in order to to reverse that push towards that vegan, what I call anti human genocidal agenda which I really think what it is, yeah. you know, yeah. in order to reverse that, we need allies. And I think doctors, you know, the more doctors come around and advise their patients to eat meat, to eat more meat, and to unbrainwash them from this, you know, meat causes cancer, meat causes this and that uh, nonsense, 
it, the better it is. And um, yeah, and we definitely need need good doctors who who come around and start seeing that. So. Um, Phil, it was great. I'm out of questions. I think I got more than I than I went in for. I mm -hmm. went in, originally. I went in for the cancer story, but uh, I got a Graves' disease story and a psoriatic arthritis story. <laughs> so I'm all satiated. <laughs> <laughs> and, oh, cool. Um, so yeah, thank you very much. And um, I guess I see you in the Facebook group. And um, yeah, if you want me to include any contact information, any links to to stuff that you want me to include, then I can do this in the description below the video. Sure, yes. I mean, you know, if anybody wants to chat and have a consult, I'm, I'm happy to do that. I do that over Skype and um, my website at pureactivity.net and and the, f the Facebook group 100% Carnivore and Beyond. I also, if, if anybody is listening to this with psoriatic or rheumatoid arthritis. I also have one with a big mouthful of a name, see if I can remember it. Psoriatic and rheumatoid arthritis, mitochondrial health and carnivory. Anyway, something like that Facebook group, which is cool. I got, I got thrown out of all the arthritis Facebook groups because they don't like to hear about people actually healing. They like to sort of sit around and moan about methotrexate and, and all the drugs they're on, which is a real, it breaks my heart, you know, but if, if you actually go in with any advice or actually say you might have fixed something it's not long before you're thrown out <laughs> even out of the natural ones but um, so so yeah i've got a got a few things there on online and i have a i have an, an autoimmunity course the subtraction method which kind of covers all these things of taking things away you know i think it's on the subtraction method.com but yeah it, it's a it, it's a joy to talk to you and, and just great that people are out there and bringing this knowledge to people you know because we we all fit in these little pieces of the jigsaw, but the good, the cool thing is that I think we all have kind of less ego, and we realise we are just one piece of the jigsaw instead of um, instead of a lot of the medical system that thinks that they are the whole jigsaw when they really are probably one little tab off the corner of one piece of the jigsaw, <laughs> and that's from another jigsaw that somebody else has lost the bits to. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I think I definitely meet is one big, one big piece of the puzzle, definitely. Yeah, definitely. All right, so thank you very much once again. You're so welcome, Paula. Yeah. Lovely to talk to you. Bye.